If they include a dog mode where we get to play as a dog in some sort of capacity, I will buy this game for $60 at launch. For the PC, not the Xbox. But I will make videos about it, I will review it, I will do all I can possibly stand to do to cover the release of this game if they include a dog mode. I feel like an idiot. I guess I was young and naive back then. I didn't really expect the worst from this game, but I at least thought that it would be fun to talk about. But it's really not. The campaign in Call of Duty Ghosts is exceptionally hard to review for a number of reasons. First and foremost, and this isn't going to surprise anyone, is that it's a distinctly manufactured experience that plays like all the other Call of Duties. It's pretty hard to enthusiastically talk about features when there's nothing really unique or original to say. But what's less obvious, and what makes it actually pretty weird, is that it's not really all that bad. Everyone loves to hate them, but the Call of Duty games are not objectively bad. By most dispassionate and technical measures of a game's quality, they stack up pretty well. They're always polished to a mirror sheen. They're generally bug-free and well-optimized. The production values and the budget that goes into the single-player campaigns are sky-high, with some Hollywood talent taking up the reins for writing and voice acting. And this shows in gameplay. Spectacle and polish combine with tight direction and exciting pacing to compensate for the linearity in these games. The multiplayer half is always a sinisterly balanced Skinner box that is scientifically chiseled down to a pure, raw core of addictive adrenaline rushes. Fast deaths and slow movement means you have to stay constantly focused and twitchy. It's a maddening and frustrating game that's impossible to put down. And there's the slow metered unlocking system that evokes the shallow sense of progression. It's no wonder that this is our real-life dystopian cyberpunk blood sport. And remember, these games exist inside of a wider consumerist culture that likes to value entertainment as well-produced commercial products rather than meaningful or stimulating experiences. In this monstrous cage that we built for ourselves, a game that is thoroughly designed, marketed, and sold as a well-produced product is going to get a lot of sales. Call of Duty is not objectively bad. It has won the game of American capitalism, and that game is not about thinking creatively and taking risks. It's about narrowing down what the audience wants, trying to hit that again and again until it works just once, and then exploiting your workers to print off millions upon billions of that one thing until it dies. Call of Duty is not objectively bad, and it is going to die soon. Wait, that's not even what this video is about. Hold on, hold on. The campaign for Call of Duty Ghosts is a satisfying and exciting roller coaster ride that horribly shows off the weaknesses of its own format. You can usually rely on Call of Duty to provide some pretty good dumb popcorn entertainment, and while this one is a notch weaker than its predecessors, it still delivers. But it feels far more stale than it should. There's a number of exciting little bits and pieces in there that just aren't explored thoroughly enough. Instead, they're shoved out of the way for the series' own tired cliches. It's actually too fast-paced and too compressed for its own good, and the overall impression suggests that the motley soup of developers that are now making the Infinity Ward games may not necessarily be out of ideas, but they may finally be out of steam. So, the series has moved on from antiquated warfare to modern warfare to postmodern warfare, and the funny thing about the newer games compared to the old is that despite being so similar, their strengths lie in almost the exact opposite kinds of set pieces. Good scripted events are those that feel like they could adapt to the player messing with them. They've got to be able to adapt, but there's also got to be some kind of contextually relevant stakes or obstacles encouraging the player to not mess with them. For first-person shooters, they have to frame that simple game of target shooting as something greater than it actually is. And the big outdoor battles did that very well in the old CODs. They were dynamic but self-contained. Enemies usually didn't respawn endlessly, and if they did, then triggering them to stop was a generally long and demanding gunfight. But those big outdoor battles are now the most laborious parts of the new games. The design of these things has just really gone downhill. Like, take a look at Homecoming, the fifth level in Ghosts. Most of the levels aren't big battles like this one, but a few are, and it's important to note that your progression through these things isn't really tied to your skill at the gunplay, which is at the core of the game. It's tied to extravehicular gimmicks, like these remote-controlled airplane turrets. The game goes unnecessarily out of its way to shoehorn old gimmicks like that in. They play the same role as a quick-time minigame. They're just wearing a different skin. 
your remote control turret your way from one location to another, occasionally fading to black to watch your character tumble into the next area. I especially like how you can pause and take a few seconds in the turret to blow up this helicopter while being fully exposed to and taking fire from that very same helicopter. Other new scripted gimmicks are just kind of half-assed. Like how you can press Q to dog attack for like a grand total of 10 minutes of the game. You don't even have to do that anyway since shooting in COD is just point and click. The dog doesn't really help you out in that regard. There's a legit dog stealth level in there too, complete with various states of guard alertness and silent dog takedowns, and it's over in about 6 minutes. There's space combat too, which is absolutely ridiculous to think about and actually really fun to read about. Did you know that guns actually work in space? Shooting them would blow your body back a few inches and any bullets aimed at the horizon would end up spiraling into orbit and may come back at your backside. And of course there wouldn't be any sounds and I'm not saying they should have gone all hard science for this section, but they could have played with the rules of the game to at least make it a bit more interesting. But basically they just copy pasted the same controls from the underwater combat and like everything else in this game that might be interesting, it's all over in six minutes anyway, so it's not like you get to savor the moment and enjoy it. A lot of weird instances look like malicious design decisions. Like how this guy who you're supposed to shoot has a name hovering over his character, even though that's an indicator that is always used for friendly troops who you're not supposed to shoot. Or this forced death at the end of the tank level which makes it look like you're playing really bad even though you're supposed to die. When the great energy producing deserts were destroyed, the world powers that depended on them collapsed. The storyline is a new continuity set in a defeated and almost post-apocalyptic America after their orbital space missiles get hijacked by a South American superpower called the Federation. It's up to the ghosts to hijack them back and blow them up with their own space missiles again in a totally unironic orgy of environmental destruction. You'll swim through a beautiful coral reef before sinking a battleship on top of it. You'll crack through Antarctic glaciers and exploit oil rigs over the ice and run over solar panels in your big ass American tank. It looks like Julian had his work cut out for him. And throughout this whole affair, they don't exactly define what a ghost is and why they're so important. Are they a unit of the army, like the ghosts in Ghost Recon? Or are they something like a branch of the marines? Or are they just an A-team of renegade buddies, cause we only see like four of them in the whole game? But even though no one seems to know exactly what a ghost is, these people really care about whether or not they can consider themselves a ghost. You were never one of us. You're not a ghost. They also don't really give much backstory to this whole federation thing. It's a South American superpower that is downright fanatical about perpetuating a stalemate war against the US, but I guess out of all those things, the one that seems the most fishy is the whole notion of an anti-American, South American superpower in the first place. I mean, all the countries down there have always been on good terms with the US, and sure there's Venezuela off doing its own thing, but oh my god it is Venezuela. And don't worry, even though the enemy's closer to home this time, that doesn't mean they dialed back on the jingoistic racism of the series. There are ancient tribes deep in the Amazon who have perfected the art of torture over hundreds of years. The Federation embraced this heritage, enhancing it with more sophisticated methods. So you have a very vaguely defined Invasion USA plot with a very vaguely defined and unusual enemy, and all that actually works to give the plot a kind of fantastical dimension to it that isn't there in the modern warfare games. It's easier to suspend your disbelief when the whole premise is so unbelievable. Plus, all the main characters this time share a family relationship. Your sidekick through the whole game is your brother, and your commanding officer is your father, so the entire plot is a weirdly macho family affair. But it doesn't really take advantage of having that more personal plot. For a great example, just look at the actual first reveal of the ghosts themselves. You have two brothers and their dog wandering through the treacherous post-apocalyptic American wilderness. They're suddenly attacked by a pack of wild wolves when an unseen roguish figure dashes from the bushes and saves their lives in the nick of time and that's such an 80s cartoon moment. It could have had so much more personality but it ends up playing it off with bland, gravelly voiced pseudo seriousness. Alright, we don't have a lot of time. You can stick with us but you do what I say when I say it, understood? The dog is another missed opportunity. 
Six months ago, when I was going on my little tirade, I said that dogs are a great storytelling device. And I actually wasn't being sarcastic there. You can easily pull off a lot of extra drama just by throwing a dog into the plot. Show a villain cuddling up with a dog and bam, you instantly gave them a sympathetic side, making them a deeper and more three-dimensional character. Show a villain kicking a dog and bam, you instantly turn them into even more of a despicable one-dimensional villain who's gonna have to get some karma eventually. And I know that throwing a dog in there is a real cheap trick, but sadly enough, I don't really expect more than that out of COD. These games are dumb popcorn entertainment, so I was disappointed to see them fall below my low expectations and underplay the dog's role in the story. There are only six minutes of playable dog mode in the entire six hours, so it's not like he's very important to the game, but the plot just kind of forgets about him before the first act is even over. When the plot does remember him in the third act, he gets shot, but there's not a lot of drama surrounding that event. It isn't a named villain doing the shooting, it's just some nameless, faceless sniper who you obviously should be able to shoot first, but the game won't let you. It's a non-lethal wound anyway, and like all non-lethal video game wounds, he just shrugs it off, and five minutes later you see Riley healed up good as new, so the game just forgets about him again. Oh, and the voice acting is way more, uh, acted than usual. Dad. This whole time, you, you were one of them, you were a ghost. Try the ghost! That's your commanding officer. What's funny though, is that compared to the older ones, the newer Call of Duty games play best when they're acting like a highly scripted stealth game, when they're throwing you in smaller indoor areas with quieter combat and tighter narrative control. Which is weird when you think about it, because people seem to hate having their hand held through these things, but people also really liked that all gillied up level from Modern Warfare 1. And in this campaign, there's a strong series of mid-game missions that continue in that one's tradition. It's actually at its best when it forgets about the dog, when it forgets about the big outdoor battles, and when it trades out those ruined post-apocalyptic cityscapes for something cleaner and more high-tech. But really, the short 10 to 15 minute levels in this campaign are such a mishmash of quality and styles that it almost feels like reviewing a music album. Federation Day is satisfying in a Call of Deus Ex sort of way, with some stealthy climbing segments that change up the usual angles of gunplay and give off a real sense of vertigo, you also get to duct tape a strobe light to your gun. The Hunted begins with a surprisingly open-ended stealth section where you can play as stealthily, loudly, or lethally as you like. For five glorious minutes, you're all by yourself for once, and the game doesn't kneel to any particular playstyle. You can pick people off one by one like you're the predator, or just get down low and crawl through this foggy, wet jungle that looks a whole lot like Crisis. And by looks like Crisis, I mean it looks good. Clockwork has your dudes going on an intricate infiltration mission that plays out a whole lot like a fancy Hollywood bank heist. Occasional shooting galleries eventually open up to a base defense section where you have to scramble back and forth to pick up different kinds of mines, and you can experiment with the different ways they blow people up. And of course, there's a reel of monumentally stupid cutscenes that just defy logic, so there's plenty of sarcastic belly laughs if you're smart enough to not take this stuff seriously. Like when your sidekick uses Riley as a grenade, he just tosses himself into a window and that scatters bad guys out of a room. Or how this monitor can withstand your bullet holes but not your sidekick's punch. Or these goggles that the main menu shoves in your face when you're loading up your save game. It's, it's like Sam Fisher wanted to see at a 180 degree angle, like a cow. And there's this one part where you're on an airplane and there's another airplane who scoops the bad guys out of your airplane by flying perpendicular to it and roping down and, and the front half of your plane falls off. So yeah, it's not all bad. It's got some good missions and some enjoyably stupid spectacles if you get a laugh out of that stuff. In fact, I would say that the overall campaign is not that bad at all. But if you've been following the channel, you would know that I played the Battlefield 3 campaign a few months ago and God, almost anything looks like fun after that train wreck. But what's pretty evident about it is that being Call of Duty might actually be the biggest thing holding this campaign back. As this franchise grows old, it's finally time for it to slow down for once. This is a campaign that would have been better off if it let you stop and smell the roses. That dog stealth section was over in six minutes, which is about as long as you spend climbing down those towers or sneaking through that jungle or getting into a massive gunfight in goddamn outer space. You'd think they'd want to show that stuff off and relish in it rather than quickly shove it out of the way for the next thing. A linear, stop-and-pop scripted shooter can work at a slower pace. It can work with survival or RPG mechanics with long sections of atmospheric quiet time and flavorful dialogue. 
That's exactly what Metro 2033 does. And with Call of Duty now teetering further towards its own apocalypse, it would be nice to see it take similar liberties with its setting, rather than suffering from the financially lucrative symptoms of overproduction and soulless playtesting. The mass market has been asking for this roller coaster ride of dumb thrills for years, but maybe now with this one, they'll finally change their minds. And maybe in response, the company will finally take some chances with the next game. Dad, this whole time you you were one of them. You, you're a ghost. Try the ghost.